I think we can start. Hi everyone. Uh, so it's the first meetup uh, about advanced Ruby that we want to organize here in Singapore and we would like to continue later. Uh, this time we will be exploring how the everyone's favorite libraries, Prockets, works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first of all, we've got sponsor. Uh, thank you to Pivotal Labs for sponsoring the venue and, and food and drinks. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Michael for recording this meetup. I hope that someone will watch it and then more people will, will come next time. And before we start, who watched the presentation that I posted? How many people watched it? Okay. Who watched at least 10 minutes of the presentation? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> me too. I, I, I did watch a whole lot. Okay, and now more difficult. Who at least tried to read this, the source code of Sprockets or Sprockets Rails? Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, so question, since there's just two of us, you will replace me later explaining some part. <laughs> Come on, yeah. Okay, so uh, since this is a meetup where there is no one presenter, I would like everyone to contribute by asking questions and by explaining the, uh, the things that we will be reading here. I'm just going to go through some basic stuff with sprockets, how to use it, and how, how it works on, like, the, on the surface, and then, Following that, I hope that we will go deeper and deeper, and I'm sure we will not understand even 30% because it's too complicated, uh, but I hope that we will at least reach some level from which you either can understand the rest of sprockets yourselves, or you can realize that you don't want to know how it works, <laughs> and you're just happy that it does. Okay, so uh, one thing about sprockets is that it has a few versions now. Mm. So the version that you're probably using in your application is version 3.6. And if you're having some Rails 5 application or you're using the Rails master branch, then you will have the version 4.0 beta. So it might have happened that if you check the source code and I read the source code, we were reading something totally different because the difference between these two branches is around 500 commits and uh, around a, a year of work. So it's, so it's quite significant. So in this code that I will show you, I will use the version 4.0 beta. And there is this second gem that I will actually start with. It's called Sprockets Rails. So this gem is a rail, uh, like the layer between Rails and Sprockets that allows these two libraries to work together. So how I, uh, I will maybe start with how I actually started digging into the code. So first thing that I did was uh, I don't have sprocket rails. Let me just quickly download it here. Ah, yes. Now, good enough or still too small? Okay. Okay. So the first thing that I did was I checked how Rails uses sprockets. So I went to do the sprockets Rails gem and I checked the rail T. And uh, I didn't learn much from here. It was a bit complicated, but what I found is is it here or is it in the task? Yes, this. So what I found is how the Rails assets precompile task works. So this is the entry point. This is what you call when you when you uh, build these uh, these assets files in your production. So then I check that what it does is actually it, it's just one line of code. It's manifest.compile. So then I checked what is the manifest. And manifest, and here we're going directly to Sprocket's library, is a is an object from, from Sprockets. So now we can go directly to the gem. It's here. We've got Sprockets and we've got Manifest. So this is the file that we, that, uh, this is the object that we built, the manifest.new, and then we compile it. So now we need to check what actually this manifest does. 
Unfortunately for us, it takes the asterisk arcs as argument, so basically we have no idea what, what it means. Yeah, so fortunately, right after, we see that, okay, there is environment, there is directory and file name. So we've got some, uh, we've got some hints here of what, of what the manifest can do. So we've got this initializer that I didn't really go deeply later. I just checked that it has this method called compile. And once again, it takes args. So once again, I don't really know what exactly these arguments mean. But fortunately, documentation says that I can provide application JS. So that's, that, that sounds like a plan. So let's, let's start by doing this. So uh, go here. OK, so here I've got my uh, Rails application, and here I'm in the console. So I will do sprockets manifest new. OK, this requires output file name. So let's call it uh, manifest.js. OK, it created an object, uh, but it apparently doesn't have data that it requires. So we, need to, we will need to provide some data. But let's see what happens if I just do manifest new and compile. OK, it requires environment. And this is the, my biggest trouble with sprocket. So it has this environment file. Uh, it's here. This file and this object of environment is apparently uh, just the whole configuration for your application. So you provide the paths that you, that you want uh, sprockets to take care of. Uh, you provide some caching. And this file seems small, but actually you need to go to base. Uh, and it's not so small, and it's not so easy anymore. So it includes a, bun a, bunch, a bunch of other stuff. So anyway, I figure out that I will not get deeply into this uh, environment, and I will just check how Rails uses it. So Rails does something like rails.application.assets. And here we've got this environment file, uh, environment object. So I can provide this object as environment. So if I do something like this, uh, Ah, uh, wrong. The environment. environment is first. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, now I do manifest compile. Okay, it returned me nothing uh, because this file needs a argument, and the argument might be might be some files like application JS. So let's see what it will do. Uh, Okay, it throws, no, okay, it works. So now what it did was, as you see, I, I've got this new manifest file here, and this file, uh, this file just contains the information about the files. So my file, the logical path is application.js, but the path, the actual path one will be application dash and then this, uh, this hash of, of this particular file dot js. And the same, uh, the same will be with more files if I provide, if I provide J, uh, CSS or, or another files will have this. And except for that, we've got these two new files here. So these are actually both the same files. One is just uh, gzip, the other is not. And this file is compiled uh, application.js that I have. So my application.js, what it requires 
is just jQuery, jQuery UJS, Turbo Links, and then all the files that I've got in directory uh, in this tree, which is nothing. So the only thing that it contains is packed jQuery uh, and these other two libraries. So that's the extremely basic version of how Rails and Sprockets work together. It just creates this manifest file, uh, manifest object, you compile it and, and that's it. Uh, but if it was that, the Sprockets wouldn't be so much both loved and hated by the Rails community. So there is, there is more than that. As you see, this file here uh, is just JavaScript, right? It's not even minified. Uh, we've got all the comments. Basically, it packed all the content of these files together and, and threw it into one file. And that's one of the reasons why it's so slow, because what, what this Rectas does, it's just, it takes all these files together to a memory, and then it writes this big string that is like a few hundred kilobytes uh, to one file. That's why, that's why it takes so much time, because Ruby is not extremely fast, especially with handling such, such a big strings. So okay, that's the manifest, and that's how we compile all the files, but this is pretty boring, so I thought that, okay, I know how I, I know how it packs all the files, but what happens if I have CoffeeScript or SCSS, right? This is just copying JavaScript to one file, and that's it. So then I thought, okay, Sprockets has two kinds of, uh, two kinds of processors. First is preprocessor, which means that it does something to JavaScript or CSS before packing to file, and then you've got post-processors, which, uh, which formats then after that. So example of the preprocessor is directive. Uh, it's not here, it's here. So it's directive processor. What it does, it, it, takes, the, uh, it takes your application.js or application.css file, and these weird comments here that you've got, it actually parses these comments and requires all these files. So it basically finds all the, all the files that you want in your JavaScript or CSS uh, and it grabs them all together. So let's try to just do this one thing. Uh, so we've got this sprockets directive processor object and it accepts a, a hash and this hash needs to contain data. So let's start with saying the data is empty and see what happens. And now it fails. It fails because uh, unknown cure data. Okay. So I broke something. Let's see. Oh no, sorry, we do not need to we do not need to do initialize, we will just directly use call. So we'll do call with data and now it now it crashes because there is no conversion of nil to string. And that's not very useful, so we actually need to check uh, we need to check what exact input it, 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 it requires here. So we've got this call which calls underscore call and then we've got a bunch of bunch of variables that it creates. So we need to provide a hash with certain predefined fields there. So let's try to just define all of this, these fields that we have uh, and providing nil there. So we've got um, let's use empty strings. What else do I need? Uh, metadata, which needs to be a hash and URI. Okay, now let's try to call it with options. Okay, there is some progress that this direct processor worked. So it processed the files that I provided, which means no files, uh, and it returned me a data which is exactly the same as I provided because there was nothing to do with that. So, okay, now as data, I will provide something else. So I will just read this file. OK, 
okay we've got the content of the file is data and now I'm calling this and it found it found the content but now it checks the file name so the file name is uh, okay so it checks the environment so I didn't provide the environment instead of creating my own I will I once again will use the rails application Assets. And now I call it again. Okay, and now it's returning us something. So let me show you. So now we've got the dependencies that it grabbed and and the required. So required are the files that I provided in that uh, in that application.js file. So it requires the whole if you see here uh, JS. So it requires like jQuery, jQuery UJS, but also it requires the whole tree. And the whole tree of this uh, channels is empty. It's also the cable JS. So it requires that. And based on that files, it builds then it builds the whole dependencies. So, for example, jQuery Rails inside it requires a bunch of uh, a bunch of other stuff, and the same with like the same with TurboLinks. So we've got this big big list here, and it only requires, as you see, the data that this uh, the data that it requires is the parsed file without the lines that actually meant anything for us. Let me show you here. So here we've got this text. This is a manifest file, blah, blah, blah. And this is what we get here, exactly. But in the end here, we've got read sprockets, read me for details. And then it's end of this data. So it means that this data was actually parsed by the directive preprocessor and that it was removed later. So that when we provide the output of this as data to another preprocessor, it will not grab this anymore. Okay, so this is how it parses the data, but we do not have very meaningful output here. So instead, uh, I will create a simple coffee script file to, to show you how it's, how it's parsed. So we've got just extremely basic coffee script function, the function called x, returns free. And now I will use Sprocket's coffee script preprocessor and I will call it with options. Okay, let me first create coffee script options. Okay, and CF options. Okay, perfect. So we've got this, and now let's try to call it with the options. So we've got sprockets, coffee preprocessor, call, CF options. Uh -huh. It requires some more stuff from me. It will be coffee script preprocessor. What does it want? Uh, I need to provide cache there. Okay, cache needs to support the fetch method, so I can't provide nil, but maybe I can provide just a simple single hash. Let's let's try it. Okay, now it worked. So now you see that it returned us two things. First is data, which uh, which is what we will be parsing later. Uh, to, to another preprocessor, and then it required additionally maps. So we've got the source map that maps this, uh, the generated JavaScript to our CoffeeScript, right? 
So for example, line number five and column 11 from the generated JavaScript will be mapped to, to CoffeeScript line number one and, and column number seven. So this map later can be used to, to debug the, the CoffeeScript. Okay, and now we've got this origin, now we've got this coffee script, uh, JavaScript here, but it is not uh, minified. So now this data needs to go further to the next, next uh, processor. So we've got CF result. And now we'll try some uglifier on that. So we've got sprockets, uglifier compressor, and we will call it with CF result. Uh huh. Of course, it didn't work. So now what I need is amplifier line 56. Okay, it needs something like metadata merge. Okay, and now you see that the data it returns this JavaScript, but it's minified. Instead of, we don't have the enters, we don't have white spaces, and the name of the function was uh, shortened from X to N. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's not, not extremely useful. Okay, if, if the function name was longer, right, then it would be, uh, then it would be shorter, shorter now. Okay, I think these are the basics that I managed to cover and, and to read the, the, the source of Sprocket. If you have any hints or questions, or if you want to come here and share something else that you learned from Sprocket? No? No questions? To which purpose? First one, here are the options. I don't know why file name was needed here. I have no idea. Yesterday when I tested it, I provided file name. Today I was just lazy and I wanted to check if it works without it. So I'm not sure why it's what is it for. We can actually check it, right? What? Maybe it's on output. On output. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Let's let let let's see what will happen. Uh, where do we have it? Here, options, merge, file name. Yes. Okay, it returned. I don't see it anywhere here. Mm -mm. Ah, sorry. No, there is no test here, so I don't know. Oh wait, maybe it saved it somewhere actually. No, nah, neither. So I have no idea what it does. Let's see. Okay, it uses it to generate the name of directory. and finds the path and it doesn't use it for anything. Okay, uh, no idea. Anyone has some hint? What was the meaning of the file name? What was the, what the, what was the meaning of the passing the file name? Is it that the file that is I have no idea what's what's the meaning. We can check it. Okay, so here should be some. No, there is no comment in that files in, in this file. Okay, I've got no idea. If someone finds something, just just tell me. So I will check it. Yeah, it's a password file that you want to compile. 
and then he... Yes, but if I don't provide this file and I provide the content, it still works. But well, it seems like if something goes wrong, you can output that, okay, something wrong with this file. Yes, okay, let's, let's check. So this file will have some, I don't know, like... It will have a method that doesn't work, right? Require. So let's try now. Uh, sorry, I didn't reload the content. Okay, now it's fine, yes. No, it's not. Uh, so I think uh, like to use uh, the found name. Yes. Uh, it's to, it's for the, so, so you need to, uh, let me see, so we'll use the found name to get the directory. Yes. You get the directory of the found name, then the directory is used to, I say when you require a whole different, another directory. So you can try some like, uh, Oh, so, so I can provide the whole directory yeah, instead of just a yeah, file? There's, there's like, um, there's a directory that's like required directory, uh, sorry, required, required directory. Uh, okay. Yeah, so let's say if you, uh, Okay, so let me create. Okay, so now I've got, I've got it in the new directory. What now? I should do require directory, right? Yeah, in my. Yeah. So instead of this, we'll do. How did I call it? Up there. Okay, what now? So you passed in. Uh, Okay. I've got it here. Yes, I've got required directory, so I've got options. And now I should be able to. Uh, what happened with this? Okay, so I've got sprockets, directive preprocessor, call, options. Okay. Got it. Require directory argument must be directory, but it is. Okay. What? What now? <laughs> okay. Let's try. <laughs> it says that it must be a relative path, right? Okay, let's uh, let's check in sprockets. Oh, oh, in the documentation. Okay, that's not extremely helpful. <laughs> All source file of the is it? No, there's there, there's no more. Okay, let's do instead of the app here. Let's try this. Let's see if that will help. Okay. Okay, it worked now. But I still don't know what we. But I still don't think we. Do, did we provide the file name here? Mm. No. So we didn't provide the file name. 
Mm. Oh, let's try if we can do it with Neil. If it will complain now. Okay. So it needs to have some file name. It needs to be a string. But it doesn't matter what it is. Apparently. The what? The, uh, okay. So probably we can create a sub directory under the uh, JavaScript directory and then uh, create a new file there and the uh, JavaScript file that's the file. Yeah. Okay, tell me how to show it. Uh, how to show example of, to, to show it so that everyone can see what it does. Uh, you have an. Like we just read the app directory and the app directory. Where in the app type yeah. directory? This one. This one. Yeah. yeah. What what to do with it? Okay. So I've got the file there. So I will try to just require that one file. Oh, okay. If I, if I try to compile this, just this file. Uh, yeah. And then uh, in this file, we can require, from this file, we, can, we, we require the parent folder that we will break out of. Require just like here? Yeah, require right here. Okay. So. Okay, so this is copy script, so we need something like require directory. Yeah. Something like this. Okay. I've no idea if this will work. But okay, let's try it. Uh, so now. Uh, okay, options, data. That's no, ah, of course. No, that's <laughs> again. JavaScript. Okay, now it works. And now I should be able to do sprockets, directive, call, options. No, so it didn't even scan it. Because normally the directive processor, it shouldn't require this information, right? It shouldn't return it. Yeah. Okay, and let's see what will happen if I do just require jQuery here. For example, if it will find that uh, they want jQuery. Okay, let's uh, okay, we can. Mm. Okay, now it should be fine. Test JS. Okay, got it here. I will call it. Okay, it's set. The dependency. Okay, but now I'm confused. So instead of doing the required directory for the parent directory, it it took it for the parent of the Rails root. So it just like took the directory with with all my projects. File name. Here or where? The right hand side. The right side. 
The what? The right side. Uh, Fine, yeah, man. Okay. Okay, and what should I set? The, the, the problem to the data. Uh, this one? Okay. Got it. And now I will call it and... Okay. Hey, that works now. Okay, so to provide the data, we needed to provide the path because if we didn't provide the file name, if we didn't provide the path, it assumed that the path that we are passing is the main path of the Rails application. And that's why when we did like the parent directory, it showed the directory of all my projects instead of the, the one here. Okay, so file name is useful <laughs> and it's actually needed. Okay, hey, that, this is also really cool. Okay. Uh, more questions, more things? Maybe someone knows how later Rails finds the assets because I've got bug in my application <laughs> and I can't solve it. Maybe someone knows. The problem that I have is that when I use asset URL or asset path, it doesn't find this certain asset that I want. And it happens only in production. So it all works locally but when I do the same thing in production, it doesn't find the asset. The one, okay. Let's then, let's then check in the Rails code, how does it find the asset and then maybe we'll figure out what is the difference between the production and, and the development while the same thing, the same asset is found in, in development and, and not in the, uh, not in the production. Is it a file structure problem? I have plenty of those, so because everything is flattened, sometimes if, if your dependency is, keeps the structure, mm -hmm. order, then once you pre-compile everything is smashed. Okay, so everything is put directly in public, it doesn't keep the directory. Okay, I will check. I will check this. Mm -hmm. mm. I will show this problem actually. So this bug was reported half a year ago. It says that there is no method find asset for near class, and the problem is apparently that. This gem Premier Rails, which inlines CSS into your emails, that it used some private Sprockets API, and this API was changed in the new version. So whenever someone updates Sprockets, like this doesn't work anymore. And the discussion goes to April, where I hope to find solution. And this this is this is the last trace of that bug so far. So okay, I will check the different directories. Uh, I tried this solution, but it didn't work. So yeah, okay. Uh, I think if there are no more questions or if someone wants to show something created to Sprockets that you read in the source code, question, any, anything that you found that is interesting? Okay. Uh, I think we will not will not try to play to try to exploit more. Uh, but what was suggested on the meta uh, on the meta page is that we should choose the library that we want to learn next time. So I'm not sure if you want to next time if you come if you still want to work with sprockets or if you would like to try something else. I'm not sure if I want to learn more sprockets. I'm, I think I'm happy that it just works for me most of the time and it's it's a bit difficult to 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 explore more but if you have yeah i mean your opinion because uh before the asset by nine it was very clear what to do when you want to use a library not those those big libraries where you can find a gem those small ones that you need to use for, for doing small things and usually they have a structure but they need their, their own assets, their image or 
my CSS. Let's say select two, the one to that maintains a select moment. Mm -hmm. That's a good example. Let's say we don't use the gem. Yeah. I do not want to pre process uh, the library to fit into the access pipeline. I would like to take the this the this folder from select two and put it in the render asset. Right mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that's how it should work. It, it, it doesn't work. No, so. Smash everything to my exactly what I was telling, and then there's select to one time the assets anymore. Because it's expecting that structure. So, what people suggest is okay, you have to scan the library and change everything and use assets now. Okay, so you say that if select to, for example, requires some image, and the path of the image is like, I don't know, arrow.png, that it doesn't find it anymore. Yeah. And then Sprocket will smash everything into one. Yes. Folder. So, one possibility that you have is to copy all the images uh, to public directory, okay. which is not convenient, uh, but it works. The other one is that's why we have all these jQuery dash, dash Rails gems that basically take the jQuery or some other library and parse it and add these footprints to the files for you. And the third solution is called Trails Assets. So Rails Assets basically uh, generates these gems like jQuery-Rails for you. So you put everything to gem, gem file, like you can have bootstrap, you just add Rails dash assets dash bootstrap, you add rails dash assets dot org as your source, and if it doesn't have this gem, I think it will generate it. So it will take the library, it will uh, it will parse these files, it will like generate the code that later uh, later will add these footprints to all the files names. Uh, I haven't used it myself, but a few of my friends use it, and they say that well, it's not something they would love to have. But that's it's like good enough, right? Yes. Because yes. Be well, but it's like so. You want to use partially asset pipeline, and uh, partially you don't want to use it. Race is not. It's it's omakase. Race is like I give you. You either take it or not. You can't change it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Like of course, uh, I agree with you that this is a problem. But this is just like the. Sprocket said that either it works with everything or, or you don't use it at all. So what, what, what I suggest now when people have this problem is that not, not to use asset pipeline at all. Just use some uh, JS package -ment. Use, I don't know what, what is trendy now, what's branch or webpack or maybe it's also old now. Okay, yeah, I'm using Bower, I'm an, I'm an old man. I'm using Bower and I'm... <laughs> yes. Well, it, it works. It never failed. <laughs> so I have no reason to I have no reason to change it. Or together with Sprocket, or you use Bower Rails? Uh, I don't know. I think I use Bower Rails. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. So in my gem file, actually, some of the files are in the gem file. The ones that I need to replace this asset. Some of the ones that I don't need. Uh, I can use either these race assets or I can just put them into Bower JSON. So it's like, for me, it's a balance that I don't want to keep all my JavaScript in gem file. I want to like keep as little as possible. But because asset pipeline is better than no asset pipeline for me, then I still, uh, I still, I still try to use it. Yeah, but the the perfect solution 
if you don't have to use asset pipeline and you don't want all this stuff that it gives you, just use some JavaScript, purely JavaScript. Yes. So it has this Bower Rails gem has this rake task that will get all the JavaScript files and that will attach automatically all these ja digests. So you can actually put like uh, I don't know this select two for example. It will be in your vendor. You don't need to use the gem. It's that like this Bower Rails will do it for you. Uh, but then because it's partially Ruby, partially JavaScript, it's still not like very pure solution, right? I don't really understand how the Bower result works. How it works? Yeah, the, the results. Like, I, I, I feel like, okay, I have had and then it works, but is that magic? Okay, is that a good topic for the next meetup? <laughs> 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 no, like, and Bower Reels doesn't really work with Heroku. No? I don't use Heroku. They don't have any endpoint in Asia, right? They don't have servers in Asia. Yes. Probably, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that's why I don't use them because, oh, well, I see. if I have clients in Singapore and that they like server in Singapore, it makes sense, but having clients in Singapore and server in the US, like, doesn't really. Anyway, uh, okay, so let's maybe quickly check what are the other libraries that you would like to see next time, and I think that the Bower Rails is number one, right? Any other suggestions? Any other ideas? Hey, are you looking to CSRM? Cross site request for the CSRM. Because there's just like one big black box. <laughs> okay. Uh, but this is not like a library, it's just like part of Rails. Okay, okay. Rack. What? Rack. 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 Okay. Oh, okay, but then you are sitting here. <laughs> okay, anything else? Any other suggestions? Uh, one from me is Sidekick. That. Okay. What does it? Concurrent Ruby. Concurrent Ruby, yes. What is like that about? It's like a higher level uh, library for concurrency. Like usually we use thread yes. and stuff, so concurrent Ruby is like a. So it gives you like actors, for example, something uh, like this? Uh, or futures. Okay. Okay, I know that Rails depends on that right now, yeah, yeah. But, but I haven't yeah. checked that. Okay. Uh, so what I will do, I will add all of these as suggestions on GitHub issues in the Ruby SG meetups, and then everyone can vote. And let's say in like two or three weeks, we'll see which has the most votes. And then we'll prepare, everyone will prepare a bit <laughs> of that one library, okay? Well, uh, I think this is all for today. Thanks everyone for coming, and I really hope that you will come uh, uh, also, also next month. Thanks.